Hi, everybody. Will Alexander here. This week on the interview chair, we have Basenji royalty, Mr. Michael Work. So I tracked him down and we have a conversation with him. So sit back and enjoy Michael for the next hour or so. Hi, everybody. Will here. Today's interview guest is Michael Work. How are you, Michael? I'm great. How are you, Will? Good. It's good to see you. How you been? Not too bad. Yourself? I'm good. Staying busy. You busy where you are? What are you up to? I'm in Arizona just enjoying not being in Vermont weather. <laughs> yeah, I can tell by your tan. <laughs> yeah, it helps with that. I'm <laughs> headed back east for some shows in a couple of weeks. So. Oh, good. And you're feeling well? Not too bad. Good. Excellent. All right. Well, well, let's get right into it then, Mike. Tell me, how did you get involved in this sport of dogs? Tell me how old you were as well. I always wanted a dog and I never had one when I was a kid. Uh, so for my 14th birthday, my parents decided they would get me a dog. Um, we lived in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, farm country. So they figured a beagle would be good. Um, my father came home from working late one night and saw the movie Goodbye My Lady, which is about a Basenji lost in the swamps in Mississippi, was oh. made in 1954, starring Brandon DeWilde, Sidney Portier, and Walter Brennan. Um, so after seeing this movie, they decided to get me Basenji. They happened to open up the newspaper, and there was an ad in the newspaper for a litter that was no more than 10 miles away. So... Uh, we went in to visit these people and they had a litter of five and uh, the owner of the stud dog was getting the first pick. They were getting the second pick and there were three left. They said, one's a show dog and two of them are pets. And my father said, okay, well, what's the difference? They said, well, the show dog's just a little better, but we'll give you a deal. We'll give you the show dog for 150 instead of $200 if you agree to show. So my father wasn't one to pass up a deal. So he ended up Buying me the show dog for three weeks gave the people 50 bucks and we had a dog and that's how I got started in the whole thing. <laughs> well, carry on. Well, you, you, did you, when did you attend a dog show? Was this a breeder that we knew as well? No, just a little breeder in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, we didn't know what we were getting into. We had no clue. Um, Always so, the way. So to about 15 shows and we got one point. And my father said, okay, well, we did this, and that's about, you know, we'll do one more weekend of shows. Well, I ended up getting a major under Darius Weir, and five of the next seven shows, we went winners, and we were on our way. Um, that bitch, we ended up breeding, and she produced 24 champions, uh, three best in show dogs, and six group winners, and specialty winners. And uh, obviously, their third pick of the litter was the star, and... <laughs> I got very lucky, so. Wow. Now, and you had never shown dogs before, and you walk in and did this? Before, no. how, did you, how did you just, you just went in cold and just watched everybody? I, I got a video on that first show. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so I got third out of three. The next day, I, I got home and I worked, and we got first out of three the next day. And, uh, yeah, it was just watching a lot, and, you know, people, people you know, help you, you know, along the way. And, uh that's how I got to meet Dame Rowe. We bred our bitch to her dog when we went to the garden and uh, produced all this really good dog. Wow. And what year was that? That was 1968 uh, when, when I got her. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we bred her and I produced my first time bred champion probably was around 71 or 72. Wow. That's a, that's a good first litter, though. And where'd it go from there? I graduated from high school, and I went to work for a metal company um, in show dogs on the weekend. 
Uh, after 10 years of the metal company, I was did pretty much all facets and sales and purchasing manager and the whole works. And those shows were starting to change where it used to be two days, two days, three days, two days, four days. And, you know, you used to do 60, 70 shows a year. But then it started to get where 60, 70 shows wasn't enough if you're campaigning a dog. You had to do 100, 120, 140. Um, so in in 19, I did that, played around until about 1982. And uh, then I went to show on full time. So you, at this time prior to 1982, were you showing dogs for other people as well at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different dogs, breeding my own dogs and showing what I bred mainly. Um, yeah, but just I was trying to do a, a, a full time job, sixty hours a week, and then showing dogs forty hours a week, and that doesn't. It just it just didn't work. You know, you drive all night to get home Monday morning for a seven o'clock meeting. You know <laughs> that you really weren't into. So uh, yeah, played around until till then before I really got serious in the eighties. Who helped you along the way? You must have had some help along the way. Damra was my first helper. She, she, well, the Basenji God, and she, uh, <laughs> we bred to her dog, and I gave her the first two picks of the litter, and she, she made them best in share dogs. And uh, so she was, she was my main mentor in the beginning. Um, then I also started to show some elk hounds for Pat Trotter. And, uh, in the later years, it's mainly been Pat, who I look up to, and I seem to learn every time I talk to her. That's uh, just an amazing lady. So. And, you know, I mean, talking to everybody at dog shows, that's how you learn. Watch and learn. Talk to people. So, but it's mainly been Damer and Pat. And they, they advise you in about, about the handling profession, then? Pardon me? They advised you about the handling profession? Yeah, Damer said, uh, you know, if you do this for a living and somebody brings you a dog and it's not so good, but your bread and butter is going to count on it, you're going to take the show. She said, if you do this as a secondary job, she said, you'll be more picky on who you show. And that was the mentality back in the day. But uh, the, the dog show scene has changed so much to where... Uh, I mean, at the peak, I was doing 180, 190 shows a year, um, which one day I sit down and count it out. And after that, I never wanted to count again. Um, <laughs> just can't, you just can't do a real job and do, do dog show handling correctly. Unless, uh, you know, you've been there. There's only one way to do it, all in. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So in 1982, you decided to go all in. Right, right. And where'd we go from there then, Mike? Um, I ended up marrying Nina Fetter, and we showed a lot of really good dogs in the 80s. Um, the Senji breed was having a problem with a kidney disease called Fanconi syndrome, um, to where uh, our gene pool was originally, they said, from seven to 10 dogs. And uh, we didn't have a test for this Fanconi syndrome. So dogs were dying of it once, you know, not until they were probably four or five years of age, we found out that they were failing. So we decided that we needed to increase the gene pool. So the Sendry Club of America decided that we needed to get a whole bunch of people and a whole lot of money and go to the Congo and get these dogs from the pygmies and the zombies. So you know how that goes. It gets one year after the next, after the next, and it doesn't happen. Well, finally, one year, uh, John Kirby, a gentleman from Missouri, called me and said, well, I guess we're going to put it off for another year. And I said, John, if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. So in 1987, the garden was over. We got on a plane and we flew to Kinshasa in the Belgian Congo and spent a month looking for percentages in the wild. We had no idea what we would find. Nobody had gone from the United States ever that we knew of. And uh, the people that gone, had gone before, there was a woman in 1959 and a gentleman, Robert Hughes Hall from South Africa, that brought a couple back. And Veronica had gone on other trips in England and brought, brought a, a bunch of dogs back. But uh, so we had no idea what we were gonna find. Um, so we, John and I went for a month and uh, 
came back with four of the seventy puppies. You're you're leaving too much out of the story, Michael. I want to hear the guts of it all. <laughs> well, we, it was uh we we went with a hunting outfit that was uh they hunted bongo and elephant, and if you went to hunt elephant with these guys, it was a thousand dollars a day a minimum of fourteen days. If you went to hunt bongo, it was a thousand dollars a day a minimum. What exactly days. is a bongo? A bongo is a rare bongo is a rare animal. That, that's very rarely seen to the point that it's so rare. One morning I got up and we were overlooking this canyon because we were going to look for bongo. And I said to I said to one of the guides, I said, Gert, when's the last time you've seen a bongo? And he looks at me and says, I've never seen a bongo. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, I did see the animal, the bongo horns on on the cut. It was uh, the mess kitchen, but uh, so these guys were taking us on a dog safari. And uh, we didn't pay a thousand dollars a day. We paid a hundred dollars a day because they were la laughing at us. They, what, you know, what are you going to do with these dogs? You know, it, didn't, it, it was it was all funny to them. So uh, we went and uh, we brought we brought four 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 dogs back. Um, the next year, Damra and John Kirby and Stan Carter, another friend of mine, went and brought six or seven more back. Um, and uh, then we approached AKC about getting them registered because, um, you know, people said, well, you have pedigree. And I go, no, they didn't have paper and pencil. So, you know, there's no pedigree. Um, and they said, well, how do you know, how do you know that they were purebred? And I'm like, well, we're so deep into the bush and into the jungle that um, there was no other dog around of any kind. So, so were these like... These were owned by the hunters and these they're, dogs? They're owned by the, the, the Anzandi are, are farmers. So they would have a hut and they would stay there and they would farm, they would do crops and stuff. The pygmies are hunters. So they would take their dogs and they would hunt an area and then they would move to another area. So they would move around with their dogs. Both of them had used the dogs as hunters and companions. Uh, you know, it was a very strange situation where you we, we, we took a couple land rovers the first trip and we were going through the jungle and you'd stop and you'd see a hut and the guys would come out and say hi, you know. You said hi, you know, do you have any dogs? No, and you go 10 feet and there was a dog behind the hut. You know, they didn't know what you were there for. So finally we told them we just wanted to take their picture and give them a little money. And uh, then if they brought some dogs out that we liked, we said, well, you know, then we started negotiating, you know, what, what, what we wanted to buy. And they would pretty much charge us what they charge us for a chicken when they sold a chicken or whatever. Um, and they didn't, a lot of times had used for money. So we traded them um, watches, sunglasses, red bandanas, big lighters, beer, salt, whatever, whatever it took to, to get a dog from them. That's amazing. So we did we did that and uh, we approached the uh, American Kennel Club and 1989, Damra and John Kirby and I went to New York and sat down with Jim Crowley, Terry Stacy, and a couple other their people, and they we explained the health situation and why we needed to do this. And their answer was, "Okay, well, why don't you take those five dogs you brought back and breed them?" I said, "Okay, you take those five. Each litter has five to seven puppies. Multiply that out five generations." And I said. You have 2,500 dogs that aren't good for anything. So they said, well, you're right. So it was a time when there was a lot of problems with the kennel club between fighting and bickering amongst things. And I think they said that this was, figured this was a pretty good thing to do, so they would do it. So they gave us blue slips on 21 dogs, fire on them, damn on them. Wow, that's an amazing story. So these dogs were put into the breeding program then? Uh, in the breeding program, um, we didn't have brindle descendants back then. We only had red and white, tri, and black and white. And uh, so the standard had to be changed to allow the brindle color because there was originally some brindles brought back in the, in the 40s and 50s into England, and they died of distemper and different things like that. So none of them ever survived, so they didn't have those genes. So uh, all the brindles that you see now in the ring come from what we went and got in 1987. Uh, I also went back in 2006 and 2011, 20 years later. Um, so yeah, it's uh, 
it, it, it was an amazing trip. It's like a treasure hunt. You're going down the road and you didn't know where the next freight was going to walk out in the middle of the road. <laughs> you know. Like then, the Indiana Jones of the Senjis. Then you do, you know, it's like, okay, well, these dogs have never had a lead on their neck or put in a crate or anything. So we figured out the best way to do it was to bring puppies back. So uh, we brought puppies back. And a lot of times we don't know what's going to turn out to be. So uh, even some that we had slips on, we never registered. If we didn't feel they looked quite right or weren't good quality, they, they didn't get registered. Okay, so you were you were seeing. Well, we went in 2006, or we went in 1987. Um, then uh, waited for 20 years and went back in 2006. And uh, you would think that the company, the, the country, had gotten better, but instead it digressed. They used to have mail service, and when they had mail service, they had to keep the roads good so they could deliver the mail. But when the mail service just get discontinued. The roads went to hell, which were dirt roads, basically. That when we went, they said we'd average 20 kilometers an hour. And I'm like, eh, that's, yeah, no way. It's got to be one more than that. But by the time you would cut down branches in the jungle and fill in holes and cut around where there were big, big ruts, we averaged 20 kilometers an hour. Um, <laughs> that's and, uh, you know, you, it, it was amazing. You, you think that the, com the country had progressed in a lot of different ways. And in a lot of ways, it digressed, which is sad to see. Um, so uh, we went, let's see, 2000, 2006, 2011. Um, I'd like to do one more trip. Um, there's a lot of people that want to go. I'm concerned about the Lord's Resistance Army as far as terrorists and that have sort of gone into the missions and taking kids hostages and kill missionaries and stuff like that. And uh, I just want whoever I take to be safe and bring them all back. Um, you know, uh, and there's a lot of people like... that have gone with me the first time and the second time that I like to take back. But the more people you get, the harder it is in getting to point A to point B. Because if you went in vehicles, it's not like you had a gas station to fill up and come back. You had to make sure you carried all everything in that, that you had enough to get back. Um, we did find some missionary planes and some other ways to get around, but um, it's sort of a hit and miss thing. Um, and now with with Ebola and COVID, and it's just uh, it's harder to get visas and the whole ball of wax. Uh, I'd like to do one more trip. Our original guide who was with us all the time, John Balk, he died about five years ago. So we'd have to start over as far as them knowing what we want and what we expect as far as to find dogs and the safety of it all, uh, where we had gone and where we want to go again. Uh, I want to go, the original dogs were bought from the South Sudan and we went, we couldn't get a visa for the South Sudan. So we went to the Congo I mean, we went within 10 or 15 kilometers of where the original dogs came from. Um, but we wanted to go in that area and we wanted to go more south where the jungle is more dense to where we know nobody had gone to bring in a fox terrier or a German shepherd or anything to, to, to make the breed impure. Um, so uh, there's a couple of different places I'd like to get to. Um, of course, that all takes time and money and people. So. One well, more I, hope trip. You, I hope you get it together. That sounds like an exciting trip. I'm not sure I want to go with you, but that sounds like an exciting trip. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you come back and you kiss the, kiss the ground and you thank God for what you have. Because I'm sure. Nothing. And uh, wow. sort, of, sort of gives you a whole different outlook on what it's all about. That's for sure. So did, I, I, none of the puppies that you brought back over were shown, though. They were just introduced into the breeding um, program. Were, yeah, they were said her one bitch and she got some points on her that that's that was my one thing i would like to do i would like to go and i would like to to, to get a dog from the pygmies and the zombies and bring it back here and walk in the ring and finish it. there were a couple that i think i could have done that and uh they wouldn't sell them to me i offered a guy more money than he was ever going to see in his life which wasn't a lot of our money but more than he was ever going to see and he said now all his wives would fight over the money and um, we went back <laughs> and he disappeared. Uh, it was a beautiful bitch. And 
you know, uh, but that 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 uh, that's my dream to find one that's good enough right out of the bush and into the ring and become a champion. I mean, we've done a half brother, half after, but he read one generation and and I finished the first Pindle champion at seven months and six days old. Um, but uh, so so anything you see Brindle is from our trip and plus red and whites and now we have a new where the tricolor is like a raccoon marking with the tip and filled in under here. We're getting tricolors that are we call open face. Uh, they're all red and then black the rest of the body. And I finished the first one again two years ago. Um, it was ever shown. Nobody's tried since, but uh, you know, more and more. Wow. So, that's really interesting, Mike. I didn't know all this. I knew about the trip. I didn't know the details about it. I think I knew about the lighter. I think you told me about getting a dog for a lighter or something at one point. Yeah, you can get lighters for them. It's funny what they want. And then the next time we took a lot of costume jewelry and they all come running out and they get this. And then they wanted to trade. And then they saw, well, why wasn't that one in the bag? So we had to get into the Land Rover and get more more costume jewelry from them. And then then they wanted sunglasses. And they wanted they wanted uh, the guy went with watch that his his parents gave him he's 20 years old and you know it wasn't an expensive watch but it meant a lot to John yeah. where he got it. end of the trip they got the watch and we got you know we we got some design throwing knives and some bells that the dogs wear around their necks and, and different things from them and they're sort of cool. That's amazing. So when you you, you were showing dogs throughout this, so um are you still actively showing dogs or are you semi I'm pretty much my legs don't look like they used to. Mm -hmm. So uh I'm I I'm pretty much done showing. Um there's a couple of options on the table as far as judging and as far as I like I like to I mean I've been to Finland, I've been to Australia, I've been to Japan. I'd like to go to Europe to judge. Um or in negotiations with the kennel club as far as getting a license. Um, but uh, there's that, or uh, my nine is starting to open a superintendent business up and maybe maybe I'll work with her in that route. Um, just different things that keep me in it. For sure. Um, just can't run, you know how the body goes, man. Just can't do what you used to. I understand that. I had my hip replaced, uh, what? Yeah. Years, two years ago now. But I, I feel I feel great now, so I'm I'm back at it now. But I'm I'm uh, contemplating my next step. So you you think judging is on the is in the horizon for you? I hope. That's one of the questions you had on your list, and I I really hate to get into, but I think it needs to be gotten into. Um, I think uh, I, I I think they need to think outside the box. Uh, instead of people retiring and then say, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to judge? Um, they need to walk around a dog show and look at which guys have dogs that are winning all the time. Is all the dogs coming out this guy set up, this guy set up, and that guy set up. Maybe that's a guy that's a better judge of dogs and finds dogs to show. They're successful for a reason. They have a good eye for a dog that can find them. Um, now, what they're doing as far as judges are getting people that they weren't successful as an owner. They weren't successful as a breeder. But you know what? They can memorize the standard and they can memorize the rules and they can pass the test and they get a judge's license. But they have no idea what the hell they're supposed to look like. And there's so many people out there that that I think can add to the nucleus of good judges. I mean, Mike Kemp sitting there. You got Stan and James Powers, who I'm sure if they would get a judge's license, they would sooner do that than run around the ring. You know, there's, there's enough people out there that, you know, I said, if they, 20 years ago, they went and got a bunch of 40-year-olds and said, uh, we're going to help you get you through the system. All 20 wouldn't have made it, but 15 would have. And they would have more of a nucleus of people that know what they're doing in the middle of the ring that are, you know, not 70, 80, 90 years old. Um, I, I, think, I, I think instead of AKC waiting for judges to find them, that maybe they need to go out and find people that they know can judge dogs. That's a good point, and you know, because you do, we do, we have so many of those okay. it, it, at all. And um, you know, I mean, the, the people 
you know, you go in the ring and you have, yeah, we, there's some good people out there judging. But a lot of times we have more respect for the guys standing outside the ring that we know been in the judge, been on this for 40, 50 years, such as you, of what my dog looks like, what it looked like, you know, what what your opinion of it, sooner than the guy in your point. You know? Shame, and it happens everywhere, right? So it happens up here, it happens down there. We're not some good people. But but the way the way they're going about it, I mean, I do seminars and I have people coming in there and and I know which ones are going to be able to do it and which ones aren't, you know. Um, and and you know, I mean, you get a good dog and you know you get real picky and you show it to them because you don't know if they know, you know, that they're going to be able to find it because I don't know, they just don't have the experience and the knowledge. Yeah, that's no slight on them. It's just it's it's an experienced thing, and then not everybody has the eye. They don't. Right. Right. Just the way it goes. Like we have, I have, I have, you know, I've known people that have been in dogs a long time, and they weren't very successful. That tells you something, you know. And right, um, right, and that, that doesn't matter. If, if you can pass that test and memorize the standard and memorize the rules, and you can get it done in two and a half minutes. You move on and you get more breeds and more breeds and more breeds. Right. But uh, you know, there's so many people out there that aren't good test doers, and you know, I mean, and I know they've helped a lot of people that 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 aren't smart academically and do testing and all that get through the system. And and I mean, I I appreciate that. I know the people out there that I would rather show dogs to that basically are illiterate but but you know what you know the dog and uh i think there's so much more has got to be taken into consideration as far as who they have out there pointing pointing, pointing. i i i agree i think we've lost we've missed a lot of really good people and and, and they get they, they they gotta look at it that way what, what can we do different you know instead of the system it's uh you well, know and the way we look at it now I mean, you do the test, you pay for the test, you pay for their seminar, and then you're not going to give me a license? You know, I mean, you know, if I pay for the test and I pay for the seminar, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's discouraging, uh, you know, if you look at what's going on. Yeah, Wayne and I have discussed this quite a bit, and it, and and I, we both feel that an, an interview process would probably be the best best way to find these people, right? You know, and and uh, without losing them, um, but what do you do? You know, you they I, I can see the AKC's point of view too because they want to keep keep it fair for everybody. But I look at it like in the real world and in the real business world, if you're successful, you tend to climb faster. If you're not successful, you tend to stay in the mail room. Right, right, so why is right. our sport any different, right? right. So if it was ran more like a, a, a sports organization, like a baseball team, you, you'd see different things. You'd see- right. the best baseball players, they get to be the coaches, they get to be the managers, they get to be the general managers. Right. You know, um, because they have knowledge. Um, yeah, you can you can sit there and watch a game. If you exactly, that's a good example. You know, I, I don't know. You know, the good jockeys look at the horse and know which ones can run, which ones can't. You know, same thing. Yep, exactly. I agree. And then, and then the sports analogy, I've always I've always fallen back on that because if you look at the great sports organizations, how they rise their members from within. And they do. They look for the successful ones, the ones that have proven themselves, and they get to rise up and carry on the tradition of that sport, that that team. So I don't see any, I don't see any difference, but no. we're not in charge of things, Michael. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> That's how you said. <laughs> so okay, so. What, what you talked about mentors earlier. You talked about Damra. Who else? Who else would you would be on your mentor? Because we all have a million mentors, obviously. Even if they don't know it, we have mentors. Well, you know, there's people. They don't actually you might not know you're they're your mentor, but or you but you watch. I mean, when Peter Green first came over here from England, uh, he came. He lived in Lancaster County, uh, where I lived, and. Uh, I was a member of Lancaster Kennel Club. I was just a kid. 
but we had him come talk at one of our, our, our club meetings. He couldn't understand a word he said. Is that <laughs> But uh, Peter had always been someone I looked up to, you know. Um, Peter was one of those guys that if, if he would talk to me. He would come and talk to me about dogs. He would talk to me about life, talk to me about different things, you know. Um, George Ward. Um, you know, George was pretty quiet, never said much, you know, but but I was like George. You get to the dog show at six o'clock in the morning. And if George was there, George was usually there. But if I was there, he'd be there five minutes earlier the next dog show to make sure he was there earlier. And he wouldn't say a whole lot, but you know, you walk around at night and you talk to George and he's looking at my dog and he says, Well, you know, sort of got bad feet. And I say, Well, George, what what can I do about that? And he said, well, you know, you could soak them in alum or you could do this or you could do that. He wouldn't say a whole lot, but little things from certain people, you know, you, you know, and I, I walk around a dog show and I watch somebody grooming their Siberian or grooming this dog or that dog. And, and I said, well, you know what? I could do the same thing with my elk hound and make my elk hound look better by what I'm learning from Tommy O doing his Siberian, you know? Um, Afghan people, I have a lot of Afghan friends, Michael Canalizo, um, you know, Karen Wagner, a lot of them are gone. I used to enjoy Bear, you know, Gunther Bear. I spent some time at their kennel. Um, just a lot, a lot of people. You go to a dog show and you sit there and you watch, and you go to a ring and you watch, and you, you watch, and that's, that's, to me, that's how I learn, you know. Um, and just picking up different, you know, they're showing it on a lead. I mean, how can put the lead on the other way? Why should you do that? You know, what, what, you just gotta, so you go home and you try that on your dog, you know, and see if it works and why it works. So you say to I mean, why, why, you know, and they'll tell you, you know, I, I love to help people that, you know, are interested in actually learning. You know, I had a lot of kids work for me over the years and it's just, uh, I wanted the ones that were there to, to learn what to do, not the one that wanted a hundred bucks at the end of the week. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, you know, we learned so much, we learned it the hard way. And if we can't pass it on, you know, it, it seems like it's a waste. So, uh, you know, and as far as talking, there's, we talked about judges and quality of judges. You usually know if you have the best dog in the ring, but there's certain times where I'll ask, a certain judge what they saw so I, I learned what they're seeing not a lot of them Mike Billings Kenny Clark Pat Trotter you know what do you see so I know what I need to fix and I know if I need to put it back in the box and get another one um and you know um Mrs. Clark you know everybody loves Annie I knew Annie not all that well but I knew her well enough that she would come and talk to me I knew her well enough that she judged three descending nationals and I won two because I knew what she liked and what kind of dog it takes. Um, so, so I, you know, there's so many people out there that I think you can learn from, um, you know, but then again, if, if they're judges, you know, there was somebody brought up something on Facebook the other day, Everett Dean, I loved Everett Dean. Yeah, he was, me too. He would watch the next ring when he's done. He'd watch and he'd watch and he'd watch. And, I, you know, and I saw dogs pretty much the same way he did. And I would talk to him about, why did you do that? You know, or why, you know, and one day I grew up in Erie and I watched Afghans and I couldn't follow him. I'm like, and he'd come to lunch and he runs in and he says, Everett, Afghans. What? I said, I usually follow everything you do. What happened there? He goes, I didn't like any of them. So, you know. But, but that's the way I saw it. And uh, so many little things, I think, that we pick up from so many people. If all these retired people like the Mike Kemp aren't out there judging, they're not passing it on. Right. There's, you know? Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, and in the same token, you know, a lot of these people like Joe Gregory or different people that we all know because we spent a lifetime in it has so much to offer. Um, but if they're not out there judging, we don't see them face to face and we don't talk to them. Um, and, and that's another thing to frown upon now. We have this COVID thing and you're not allowed to go to the ring and talk to anybody. You've got to share your dog and get out. Well, we're not learning. We're not, we're not 
you know, we're not progressing if we can't, you know, talk to these people that, that spend their lifetime in it, you know? Um, well, hopefully this will pass and we can go back to doing that again. So hopefully. I just got my vaccination yesterday. <laughs> so. so I got to put the mind. So, you know, hopefully we're okay. Yep. Yep. What advice would you give to a, a young person that wants to get into to the, the sport of showing dogs? Yeah, I saw this question, you know, because, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I hope you didn't ask me that one. I hope you asked me this one. Um, you, know, you have to be very self-motivated if you're going to do it. You're going to have to do it because you want to do it and you're going to want to do it right. The guy that gives 120% is going to be, you know, he, he's the guy that's going to make it. Um, and you got to watch and you got to just learn. Go to the dog show early and sit there and watch. Um, talk to people. Um, just gotta work hard, have good people around you, and work hard. That's all you can do. Yeah. So, what about uh, apprenticing under other handlers? Yeah, you, you feel that's important. To, obviously, Art. apprenticeships. Yeah. Like I said, I like people that, like, I got a Basenji girl who, when she was 13, she came to work for me. And uh, she was interested in Basenji's and got a couple. And it had this Fantoni syndrome problem. Syndrome problem. And uh, over the years, she worked for me. And I ended up giving her a couple of my good bitches. Now she's basically breeding my whole line. You know, we talk and this, she's on it. And she has the legs and she has the will and the want to to do it. And uh, so, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're going 180 dog shows a year, Trying to breed dogs and do it right is, is pretty hard to do too. Oh, yeah. So I mean, That's Veronica right. can sit there and she can breed them and she can raise them and come to me and say, "Okay, what do we keep? What do we don't keep? You know, what's good, what's bad?" And uh, so it's a way it's a way for me to continue my lines and what I'm doing. And I try to do that with other people. Right now, I'm with these wonderful people in Arizona, and we just bred a litter and. Uh, you know, I'm sitting there watching them and helping them learn what I can teach them. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's, I don't know. You, you know, you like to see the people that you work for in the ring, when you, you know, like that kid started in juniors. I gave her third in juniors and she came to talk to me. Now she has a best in show Australian Terrier. Australian Australian cattle dog shepherd and uh, you know uh, Anne Marie who's showing the wire um, short hair pointer right now she started working for me when she was young she went to Florida with us and she you know and 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 to see them doing winning on their own the right way and that's pretty rewarding it sure is I feel the same way watching the kids work um do you have any dogs that, that stick out in your mind that you would have liked to have shown or been a part of, Michael? Um, yeah, I, I saw the question, you know. <laughs> when you, when you, the one you're showing and the one you're into at the time is is, is the one, I guess. But um, I think... I mean dogs that you haven't shown. I mean dogs that you, you've seen in, in as shows that you wish you could have shown or been a part of. No, I mean, I, I love. I had my hands on the Bombardier Elk County Pat Trotters uh, when he was a young dog, and then I put a few best in shows on him, and sent him back to California, and she put fifty best in shows on him. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, you know, I, I love that dog. To me, he was a stallion of a dog. He he was just an amazing animal. Um, you know, I. I the bitch the one in the garden the poodle bitch to me was stunning. I mean, I saw a little show in Pennsylvania, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I I couldn't take my eyes off her. You know, um, I, I I like to see beautiful dogs handled by the perfection by a good handler. You know, to me, that's just the ultimate thing. You know, to sit and watch, to sit and to sit and watch a breed, to sit and watch Springer when Kelly and Robin and I mean, they know what the hell they're doing, you know? 
um, you know, go to see Irish debtors and you and Adam, and, you know, it's like, like Andrea Glassman said to me one day, it's not whether you win or lose, it's who you beat. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I mean, you beat the best, you know, we used to, they have this owner handler thing now, and I look at it a different way. I had to get better to beat Damon. I had to get better every freaking dog show. Yeah. I wasn't going to get the word for not from second or third place or owning my, my dog. I had to, I had to work harder to get better. And, um, I mean, we're getting off track here. As far as no, I like it though, because I, I think I, I agree with you. Because I like how many great owner handlers would we have missed if they only competed in their right. own handler series, you know, back in the day. I mean, it, it's like that game. That game is a different ball game. You spend a lot of effort. It's very time consuming. But I used to sit and watch Michael Canalizo, Joy Bear, you know, Karen Wagner, Paco, and it, it was just amazing, you know. Um, because they were the best at what they did. And if they weren't the best, they weren't going to win, weren't going to be successful. Um, they could pick out the best puppies. They knew what the hell they were doing. And, uh, you know, that, that's what it's about for me. You know, oh, yeah. watching, you know, you know, and Peter, you know, Peter Green, he wasn't the greatest person in the ring with the dog, but he were back at his setup and he put him down to perfection. He knew exactly what he was doing. And, and why, um, you know, Bobby Fisher the same way when he put a terrier down or, or Gunther, you know, um, it, it's such an art with even, even, you know, even grooming an elk hound, most people don't groom an elk hound. I learned so much from Pat and, and then I do a little different. She's not what you do. I like it your way. But now I want to see your way because you're the master. You, you, you know, where to pull hair, where to, where, where to, you know, we we all, you know, at the end of at the end of time, you get good dogs, I get good dogs, this guy gets good dogs, that guy gets good dogs. It's what you do with those good dogs that, that puts you here and them down there. Oh, well, for sure. You know what you put into it, what you know, what you can figure out, how to make yours better, go better. Well, I better. find I think we all made each other better by having to compete with each other. So absolutely, absolutely. Okay, one last question, Mike. This is always the tough one. Don't tell me you were already thought about this question. You just, just have to take it. <laughs> if you could meet the 20 year old Mike work, what would you, what advice would you give him now? Well, he probably wouldn't listen. People think <laughs> I don't listen, but I, I do. I listen to everything. And uh, I might not do what they say, but I listen to what they say. Um, I just say, hold on, it's going to be a hell of a ride. You know, put everything into it and go. Yeah, that's very true. It's very true, right? Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate your time, man. It's good to I see you. Well, good luck in your ventures and uh, appreciate you doing this. I hope you got out of it what you needed. So. Oh, it'll be great. People will like it. All right, man. I'm going to say, sir. No. Well, thanks, Mike. That was a great story, that African story. I love that story. Um, if you like what you see here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. Don't forget, if you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you want to find out what's happening in Will's world, just go to willalexander.net. And don't forget about the podcast on um, Spotify, Sketcher, and Apple, and all other forums of, of podcasts. You'll find the, you'll find the, the Dog Show Drive with Wayne Cavanaugh and myself, and you'll find all the interviews on podcasts as well. Until next time.